So first of all, I want to thank everyone for um, joining us today for our... Actually, give me one second. So today we're going to be talking about the SBIR and STTR programs, the NMFAST program, and actually commercialization under the SBIR and STTR programs. Um, commercialization is one huge factor for the SBIR and STTR programs as really that's their entire purpose is to help small businesses commercialize radical innovations that nobody might be able to um, receive funding for or that it might require a lot of just outside availability of funds or services that are really hard for your average small business to um, get. So this will actually be the uh, last uh, webinar or, um, meeting that we'll be holding for our year three, uh, our year four uh, contract uh, was awarded um, from SBA and we'll be starting services on that beginning October 1st. So we'll be publishing our uh, schedule for upcoming webinars and um, any of our meetings, our workshops here soon. Uh, and of course, as of many of our clients know, we'll be holding our Innovation Summit um, focused more on uh, DOD technologies and DOD topic areas in December. So we'll make sure to send out more information about that as well. So for today, we're going to cover, again, um, three items. First, we're going to talk about the SBR and STTR programs, give a real brief overview of them, talk about their purpose, their intention, why they're interesting for a small business. Then we're going to cover commercialization. Why does a small business actually need to worry about commercialization when they look at the SBR and STTR programs and kind of what is the purpose for commercialization? And then we'll give a very brief overview of the NMFAST program and all the services that we offer. So first, we're going to talk about the SBR and STTR programs. So the SBIR and STTR programs are federal funding um, opportunities. Their mission is to support scientific excellence and technological innovation. Um, really, the entire goal of the SBIR and STTR programs are to push forward and make sure that innovation and new and novel technologies are always coming out of the U.S., that the small businesses that are really pushing the boundaries and that are making available uh, technologies, but also growing um, job opportunities, growing economic development of their communities, and making sure that those businesses can succeed, that innovation is really taking off, coming out of those small businesses and transitioning in, uh, either into the commercial market, into the hands of larger businesses, into the hands of the federal government, whoever that intended customer is. So. As we talk about the SBR and STTR programs, you're going to find a lot of commonality between the two, um, but there are some key differences that we'll cover here in a little bit. So the goal of the SBR and STTR programs are to meet the federal research and development needs. Again, just to make sure that R&D is coming out of the U.S. and that we're actually, you know, pushing forward with how are we innovative, how are we really just beating everybody else across the globe, or hopefully. Um, second goal is to increase the private sector commercialization of innovations. So this will be the very um, first time you'll hear about how important commercialization is under the SBR and STTR programs. It's actually one of the guiding tenets of the entire um, program, and it's one of their main purposes. A third is to stimulate technological innovation. So again, how are we leading the edge for that cutting edge, bleeding edge technology? And the biggest thing about innovation though, and one of the misnomers is people typically look at innovation and they always think, well, innovation means technology. Innovation means these grand ideas, these technologies that don't exist, and they think it's essentially Star Trek. And that's not what innovation is. Innovation, by the basic definition, is just a new and better way to do things. So you may have a workflow process that you've developed and that you've come up with that helps even your own business do data analytics. Well, and that's innovative. It's new, it's novel, it's unique, 
and it could also be something that could be sold to a future customer. That's what innovation is all about. It's not just, I am developing something that you would see in a LucasArts film. It's, I am doing something that is new and it's novel. It hasn't really been done before and it helps me do a process or it helps me get something to market or it helps me, the technology actually helps me do my job better. And the fourth goal is to foster and encourage participation um, in innovation on entrepreneurship by socially and economically disadvantaged persons. So this is one of the um, mandates across the entire federal government is to actually help small businesses that are women-owned small businesses, service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, minority-owned um, small businesses. Under the SBR and STTR programs, there are no um, special set-asides for any of these, but they want to see these types of businesses grow, and they want to actually help that um, innovation space and ecosystem that can make sure that these businesses can participate. So why are the SBR and STTR programs important to small businesses, and why would you actually want to seek funding under these? Well, the SBR and STTR programs are actually the government seed fund program. Uh, the government has an investment pool, essentially, that's what the SBR and STTR programs are, that can help bring technology to market. But the biggest thing for those is it's risk-free dollars and there's no equity taken. So under the SBR and STTR programs, we'll cover in a little bit here that it's a three-phase program and the different amounts um, of funding under each phase vary. Um, it also varies by the different um, agencies that participate in the SBR and STTR programs. But the biggest portion is, unlike when you go out there and you seek venture capital funding, or you try and seek seed funding, or you try and seek any other type of funding to um, help develop your idea, the government is not interested in taking part of your business. Um, for every other type of funding, you're going to have to give up some equity, whether it's a flat percentage of your business, whether it's licensing and royalty rights on the technology and perpetuity. Um, there's a whole host of different mechanisms that can be um, put into effect by venture capitals or angels. The government does not want to deal with any of that. They want to just be able to give you money, help you develop the idea, and hopefully see that it gets to market um, or that it gets to the government's hands eventually as a customer. Um, so along those lines, the company will actually retain the full data rights for their innovation. Um, you never actually give up any of your IP or data rights uh, for your innovation. You'll find this um, happens a lot, particularly if you're working with a larger company that is um, doing development on the idea or if it's under a CRADA or if they've just given you a flat pool of money to come up with a solution that they want, a lot of times you'll have to give up some sort of um, rights for that technology. Um, under the SBR and STTR programs, we don't have to worry about that. And the government will not disclose the data for at least four years after full program completion. So there's two important parts of that. Um, the data rights are just essentially the government saying, we made an investment into this particular type of technology. It's not like they're going to publish your results and say, well, this is exactly how they did it. Um, you never have to worry about that. And the second component of that sentence is the full program completion. So what that means is if you complete a phase one, your clock starts ticking for the four years. Now, if any time within that four years, you get another phase one or you get a phase two, that clock resets at the end of that additional phase one or that phase two. So you never have to worry that, well, you know, the essential uh, funding through a phase one and phase two is only about two years, maybe two and a half years. So I have to get this immediately to market. I'm losing time. No, it's from whenever the last proposal um, or the last project has gone through. So another aspect for the SBR and STTR programs is it gives you a priority position for sole source sales to the government. Um, this is actually a huge thing for a number of small businesses and a huge thing that people need to know about. 
So for DOD and NASA in particular, because they act as contracting agencies, they're always seeking to buy items from small businesses. Um, they have very immediate needs that they need um, solved, and they have to actually be able to put those um, needs to rest. So they'll send the contracting opportunities out and say, well, we want to buy so many of this type of thing. Generally, when they do that, though, they have to do an open solicitation and people will actually bid on the opportunity to sell that to the government. So you'll get an RFQ or an RFA and DOD or NASA will say, well, we have to take in all these different bids and we have to actually weigh them against each other, see who's going to be able to perform. Under a sole source, though, the government can immediately go to your business and say, you have a product, I want to buy the product. They don't have to actually compete um, for that uh, open solicitation anymore. And another big thing is there's no black marks for up to a 75% failure rate. So your phase one can continually fail. Um, you can actually win a phase one and just get into the uh, feasibility project and see that what your idea is just isn't going to work. And you will not have any black marks on your record for up to a 75% rate. Um, of course, as soon as you hit like 100% rate, the likelihood of you getting funded drastically lowers in the future. But as long as you're performing and as long as you're actually trying, you're not going to um, receive any essentially guff from the government. So the SBIR program supports R&D um, and financing of innovative technologies. It's about a $2.5 billion annual set aside because it's 3.2% of the extramural research budget for all agencies with a budget greater than $100 million per year. Um, under the SBIR program, there's actually 12 agencies that participate, and they all have their own research needs. They all have their own mechanisms for funding. They all have their own proposal um, requirements, and they all have their own thresholds for a level of um, funds available, as well as period of performance for a phase one and phase two. Um, across the SBIR program to date, there's been about 160,000 awards, and more information on both the SBIR and, and, and um, STTR programs can be found on sbir.gov. So the STTR program is a sister program to go along with the SBIR program. So SBIR stands for Small Business Innovative Research. The biggest goal for SBIR is to get technology out of small business and get it to the commercial market. Um, and under the STTR program, uh, STTR stands for Small Business Technology Transfer Research. So they want to actually be able to transition technology out of research institutions and into the hands of small businesses so that they can commercialize that technology. Um, for the STTR program, it's only 0.45% of the extramural research budget for all agencies with a budget greater than $1 billion per year. So under the SBIR program, you'll have 12 agencies that participate because it'll also be some of the smaller agencies like NOAA, uh, USDA, NIST, whereas under the STTR program, there's only five agencies that actually um, reach this uh, threshold. Um, so it'll be agencies like DOD, NSF, Department of Energy. So they'll have a much larger budget because, again, it's a much larger agency. They get a much larger research um, stipend, essentially, from the government. So they're the ones that are going to participate in the STTR program. So the biggest difference between the SBIR and STTR programs is that the SBIR program, the small business, can do 100% of the work. They don't need to bring anybody else in. For the STTR program, you have to have a U.S. research institution in the mix in some fashion. So again, the differences between the two programs. So the SBIR program, the small business has to do a minimum of 67% of the work and get 67% of the funding. So that means you can do up to a third of the work and give a third of the funds to a um, sub-award sub or a contractor um, con or a consultant. So that sub-award can be a research institution. It can be a large business. It can be another small business. It can actually be a consultant that you hire and bring in. 
it doesn't really matter who it is, um, mainly as long as they're U.S. based. And there is no formal intellectual property agreement required. So that means if you're working with an institute like New Mexico State University, you don't have to have a formalized agreement on how the intellectual property will work. Um, that is developed under the uh, SBIR phase one or phase two. So with the STTR program, because it is that cooperative research and development between the small business and the research institute, a minimum of 40% of the work has to be done by the small business and a minimum of 30% of the work has to be done by that research institution. And the research institution isn't just a university. It can also be one of the federal labs like um, Sandia. It can be a private research foundation. Um, there's a whole list of research institution types that qualify that you can actually find on the sbir.gov website. So, of course, anybody that's good at math can see that's only 70%. Generally, you have to reach 100. So that means that up to 30% of the work can be done by others, or it can actually additionally be split between the research institute and the small business. So if you want to give a little bit more to the small business, if you actually want to do almost a 50-50 split uh, between the small business and the research institution, that's totally fine under an STTR. The biggest as or the other big aspect about the STTR program, though, is that a formal intellectual property agreement is required between the parties involved. You don't have to have that at the time of submission, but that is a requirement at the time of award. So the agency can decide that they're going to make an award. They can send you a notice until you return that formal intellectual property agreement to them. You will not get any of the money. Um, and there is no, although it's a formal intellectual property agreement that's required, there's not a set template that they require. Um, they don't say, well, it has to include this language, it has to include that. As long as you have the basic information, that's all that's necessary. So we have a question here about the 40%. Does the research performed by the primary investigator count? And does the PI have to be a co-owner? So the PI does not have to be a co-owner. Um, the one thing about the STTR program and the minimum of um, 40% is that, so under both the SBR and STTR programs, the PI is an employee of the small business for most of the agencies. Um, that means that the, for mi most of the agencies, the principal investigator has to devote at least 51% of their time. Um, some of them are 20.4 hours. It depends by the agency. But most of them say that the primary investigator has to be primarily employed by the small business. However, under the STTR program, some of the agencies, such as um, Department of Energy, can allow for that pri uh, principal investigator to be employed by the Research Institute. Um, and this is one of the misnomers with the SBIR and STTR programs is that there isn't a real set guideline for how they operate across every single agency. Really, the only guideline is that a small business has to be involved and that the small business is the primary awardee and that there has to be some efforts for commercialization and that it has to be innovative. Otherwise, every other aspect can vary wildly between each of the agencies. Um, so that's something to uh, definitely keep in mind. Now, the uh, PI doesn't actually have to be an owner of the small business. The PI can just be one of the employees. If you have a systems engineer that you think has the required background and required knowledge to serve as PI, or that you think their resume is great and will make the agency interested, they can definitely be PI. So. The PI for the uh, project doesn't need to be part of that ownership matrix. It can just be somebody that's employed by the business in some fashion. Okay. So one of the things that I mentioned was that there are contracting agencies and there are granting agencies. Um, and this is across both the SBIR and STTR programs. So granting agencies are a little bit less formal in their requirements. Um, their funding is more flexible. Essentially, they just want your best efforts in research. Um, and the budget 
can be flexible. They'll actually come back and you don't have to have really have a set scope of work with them. You can actually amend it, um, amend the award. And the application that you submit actually defines what that scope of work is. Uh, and the questions and answers that you send are that any discussions that you have with an agency representative are not made public. So under a contracting agency, such as DOD or NASA, they have actually defined the scope of work. Essentially, they are saying that we have this need, we have this problem um, in the theater or in our operations, and we need a solution for it. So the scope of work is going to be defined explicitly by what that need is and how they want that need to be solved. Um, by that definition, there's going to be very little modification to that, and your payments are really going to be based on meeting some deliverables and milestones that you'll actually set with the contracting officer at the time of award. So with the difference, too, between a granting and a contracting agency, when you some are looking at your commercialization potential, when you're trying to move from that phase two to that phase three, your granting agencies aren't going to be your end customer. You're going to have to know your market. You're going to have to know how that you're going to sell that solution. You're going to have to actually know who your intended customer is. Under a contracting agency, though, you have a built-in customer. That is that agency. Um, for someone like DOD, they will have, again, that very um, specific problem that they want solved. And so because they want to solve that problem, they're going to want to buy that solution from you at the very end. Um, so that's one aspect between a granting and contracting agency that's very nice is at the when you move from your phase two to your phase three, someone like DOD or NASA, those contracting agencies, are going to be your end customer. Um, it makes your commercialization plan a little bit easier because you have a guaranteed customer, the government. And so this just lists the um, granting and um, contracting agencies. Some agencies, such as um, Health and Human Services and the Institute of Education Sciences, which is a division which, uh, within the Department of Education, actually have both the granting and contracting opportunities. Um, when you look at Health and Human Services, they have very specific topic areas you will find under their contracting agent or their contracting um, vehicle um, that act again the same they have a need that they want to fulfill and under the granting agencies you'll find that their solution sets and their topic areas are actually a lot more open they will have that very kind of wild definition about we just want to see what sort of research and development is going on so for an agency like National Science Foundation, that's why you'll find that their topic areas are very broad. Under something like software, essentially their topic area just says, hey, we want to know what's going on in software. What's new? What's developing? You know, what are you pushing forward? What's going to be interesting in the next few years? And under someone like NASA, they will say, when we send astronauts off to Mars, they will suffer these effects you know, from increased gravity. We need to be able to have a solution that does this. So they'll be very stringent. They'll be very defined. But again, that's because they are the intended customer at that um, when you transition towards that phase three. So for the SBIR and STTR structure, it is a three phase program. Um, the phase one establishes the technical merit and the feasibility. So your phase one is typically going to be anywhere between 100,000 to 225,000, depending on the agency. And it's going to be six to 12 months. Um, some agencies are six months. Some agencies are set at eight months, like USDA. And some agencies allow you to pick a time frame. You can either have anywhere between, like for National Science Foundation, you can have anywhere between six and 12 months, and you define that. Um, a phase one has about a 15% success rate of submission. The one kind of caveat to that, though, is that is for first-time submitters, generally. Um, we have heard from a lot of pro program managers and agency reps that when you submit your phase one, even if you don't win your phase one, 
when that agency reviews it, they're going to give you some feedback. They're going to tell you what was great about your application. They're going to tell you where the holes were. They're going to tell you where the opportunities are that you need to you know, further develop your application. So if you follow that guidance and you follow their guidelines, your win rate for a phase one dramatically increases because you're kind of refining that proposal almost like you do when you're doing your product development. You're continually looking at the product, you're refining the product, and you're doing the same with your proposal. So phase two is that R&D to the scaled prototype. And that prototype should be a market-ready prototype at the end. Um, typically, it's about half a million to 1.5 million over about a 24-month period. That could actually can vary based on the agency, anywhere from some of them offer up to 12 months. Most of them are 24 months. And you have about a 45% success rate of submission. That's because the only way you get a phase one, again, generally, um, I apologize, I keep having to say generally, it's just with the SBR and STTR programs, they're like um, Jedi's, you don't deal in absolutes. Um, you always have to have these weird caveats. So generally you have about a 45% success rate because to get a phase one, uh, two, you almost always have to have submitted a phase one. There are some agencies that offer things like a direct to phase two, but you have to have an amazing proposal package to essentially win one of those. And then your phase three is actually commercializing that market ready prototype. Now, we say market ready prototype because they don't want a prototype that's essentially duct tape and chicken wire and just bailing wire held together. It's a prototype that you should almost be able to stamp out and say, well, I have my prototype. I can actually set up my uh, manufacturing process and I can turn a hundred the a hundred of these out in an hour or whatever it is. So your phase three is actually taking that product and taking that prototype and making your market, um, product out of that. So that's really your commercialization is if it's the government, you're actually selling it to the government. If it's you know private industry, you're selling that product. You can actually turn that product around. The biggest aspect of phase three, though, is that there is no direct funding under the SBR and STTR programs. Now, one of the key words in there is direct funding because there is semi indirect funding. There are always other grant and contracting opportunities that can help you move um, from that phase two to that phase three. And there's other vehicles like a phase two enhancement programs, um, phase two Bs, that certain agencies will offer to kind of, if you didn't get all the way through your um, market ready prototype in your phase two, there's other contracting vehicles and there's other granting vehicles to help you develop and help you refine that product so that you are ready for the commercial market. So again, with follow-on funding, though there is no direct funding for phase three, there is a lot of indirect funding for that continued development. Um, certain things like the beyond phase two programs, like the phase two enhancement, um, phase two B, there's even a phase two E. A lot of the agencies will have a commercial readiness and acceleration program, which will um, discuss a little bit more in the uh, commercials, uh, commercialization sections. Are there other funding sources such as the um, Rapid Innovation Fund or the SARE program, which is a USDA program to actually help get innovation to the marketplace? So now we're going to talk about commercialization and why it's important for the SBR and STTR programs. So when we talk about commercialization, essentially commercialization is the process of introducing a new product or production method into commerce, making it available on the market. So really commercialization kind of has that broad definition of you're selling something and that is how you're actually doing business. So we talked a little bit about commercialization and why it's important to the SBR and STTR programs. And it's really because they want to see small businesses across the U.S. grow. They want to actually do things like buttress jobs, offer new opportunities, um, you know, help grow the economic 
a capital of certain regions. And commercial merit is actually one of the guiding principles for the SBR and STTR programs. So under the SBR and STTR programs, they say you have to be able to commercialize the product. Really, you will not get an award if that funding agency doesn't see some sort of commercial viability for that idea. If you have the greatest idea in the world and it's going to solve you know, world hunger, but there's no commercial market for it, you're going to have to find some other funding vehicle than the SBR and STTR programs. That's really just how it operates and that's how they structure the programs. That's why they want the pro that's why these programs operate in the very specific way they do. So under the SBIR and STTR programs, the agency doesn't define how that product needs to be commercialized. It just needs to have potential to be commercialized. So if you have a software solution and you want to charge a monthly rate for it, that's totally fine. If you have a one-time purchase of a integrated autonomous uh, tractor for precision agriculture, that's totally fine. They don't care how you're selling it, just that it's able to be sold um, at some point. So again, we kind of covered this a little bit um, earlier, but for contracting agencies, your end user will actually be the government. So they'll still want to see how you're going to be able to commercialize beyond the government. Um, is there actually commercial viability for the product in the uh, direct market? Um, can you actually sell this to other businesses? Can you sell it to you know, home users? Where else can you possibly sell it to? But your primary customer is going to be that agency um, or even just across the government. Uh, you may come up with a solution under a DOD server that they think is great. And the Department of Homeland Security may hear about it and come to you and say, well, we heard that this uh, you know, piece of technology operates great for DOD. We have a very similar need. Can you sell it to us? And that's totally fine. So for granting agencies, though, again, you have to find your potential customer. You have to know your market. You have to know your market values. You have to be able to describe your market potential, um, which kind of falls hand in hand with the commercial potential. You don't have commercial potential for a product if you don't actually understand the market and have potential in a market. So you really have to know where you're going with your product and where you're going with your innovation. How is it going to turn into something that everybody's going to clamor for? How is it going to turn to some, into something that will line shelves of you know, Walmart, for example, five years down the road? Who is going to be interested in that product? Because again, an agency like NSF, while they think putting innovative products out and while um, out is great, and while they want to see things hit the market, they're not going to buy it. Um, they're not in the business of buying technologies from people. They're in the business of giving money to people to help develop that technology. And some of their agents might buy it you know, on the sly for their own personal use. But NSF as an agency is not going to be a customer. So why talk about commercialization now? I mean, a lot of you probably are very, they're just getting an introduction into the SBR and STTR programs, or you're working on an idea and you know the commercial market for it is five, maybe 10 years down the road. Well, increasingly more agencies are actually focusing on commercial potential. So as discussed, the entire purpose behind the SBR and STTR programs are to commercialize technology, to be able to sell something in the market at one point, and to be able to have a viable product. Now, there's actually been a big, and I've heard this from um, one of the uh, USDA program managers, is Congress is becoming increasingly interested in where technology is going and where their R&D money has gone to. So commercialization potential and commercialization results are going to increasingly be a big, big factor in being able to win a CIBR or an STTR. Um, for instance, the USDA just released their solicitation about a month and a half ago. Um, their solicitation is actually due October 25th, and they redid their package. They added a new section to their proposal package 
um, to describe the commercial potential of the product. And they want real data. They want real mark. Well, you're not going to have real market data, but they want you know feasible market data. They don't want outlandish figures in there and saying you're going to sell 12 billion of these within your first year of producing it. Um, but they want to know that you've given it a lot of thought. Uh, under NSF, commercial merit is actually one of the three review criteria. So NSF has review criteria of commercial merit, uh, technological, essentially technological innovation, and broader impact. So you, and they don't have a breakdown of those. It's not one is weighted more than the other. All three are equally important to NSF. So even though NSF is not going to buy a product from you at the very end, you're not going to actually sell your um, commercial product to NSF. They want it. Um, they still weigh it vitally. It has to be able to hit the market. It has to actually have some viability, and it has to have a potential just place in the marketplace. Under EPA, half of the requirements in their proposal actually deal with commercialization. That's kind of a big statement because most of these proposal packages are roughly 15, well, the technical portion of the proposal packages is generally about 15 pages. So for EBA, that means you're gonna have to write about six to seven pages on commercialization aspects. And that just shows the importance that commercialization has across all these different agencies. And there's no real sharing between them. You know, NSF covers pretty much every single area of science and technology. Um, EPA is really only interested in environmental impacts. So what is actually impacting the environment? How can they you know, reduce the climate or how can they mitigate a climate um, change? How can they actually reduce, you know, impacts of coal mining? EPA is all about that, whereas USDA is all about food and agriculture. So it doesn't matter who uh, the agency is. It doesn't matter the research focus. They all put a um, stressor on commercialization. Um, the Department of Energy will actually reject a proposal that does not have some sort of commercialization plan in it. In the DOE proposal package, there's a section for a commercialization plan. If that thing is blank, your proposal will get returned without review. And speaking from someone that's actually created um, several proposals and worked on grants uh, for other jobs and other um, businesses, that is one of the worst things that can happen because that means you're 80 to 100 hours, which is a typical uh, time period for putting together one of these proposal packages, will never be looked at. Essentially, you've wasted 80 to 100 hours because nobody is ever going to see it. You will not get funded on that proposal. And then again, contracting agencies, particularly DOD, um, require a plan for commercialization beyond the government customer. So you don't have to go terribly in depth because again, your primary customer is gonna be the government, but they have to see that this is something that actually has potential within the marketplace. So now that we've talked about why you need to actually have commercial potential, really what is commercial potential? So commercial potential is the ability to sell the product or service and make money. So it has to be a product or service and it has to make money in some fashion. It doesn't have to make money from direct sales. It can actually be money from you know things like donations if this is an altruistic product, but there has to be some form of uh, essentially currency or resource exchange. Um, for commercial uh, potential, the pricing and distribution model or method has to be sensical. Um, again, you can't say that you're going to sell 12 billion of, you know, widget A for $8,000, you know, right off the bat. Um, that's just not going to happen. And your distribution model is saying you're going to penetrate the global market within six months isn't going to happen either. It's just the nature of commercial um, potential and it's the nature of being able to sell a product. So your commercial potential, and this is something that you will find in a lot of the commercialization requirements, is it has to help the company grow. And they want to see how it's going to align with that five-year plan of the company. So anybody that has a business really has an idea already where they want that business to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years. 
you know, what's your um, exit strategy for the market? And you have to make sure that whatever your idea is for selling that product actually aligns with where you want your company to be in five years. Uh, some agencies in their proposal package will actually want a snapshot. You don't, again, have to go into detail because you're talking theoreticals, but they want to know where you see your company existing in five years. And commercial potential really should lead to future innovation or continued product development. So you don't have just have a stagnant product that's going to be a one-off. Does that product actually have development capabilities? Are you going to be able to refine it? Are you going to be able to sell companion products to it in the future? How does it help align with being able to help your business grow? And what other products can actually be developed off of that? Um, these aren't aspects that you have to answer within your commercialization plan, but this really is what commercial potential is all about. How can you bring a product to market and what other products can actually be brought to market based on what you develop? So why is it important? Well, under the SBR and STTR programs, commercialization is important because they say so. Um, you have to have commercial potential. But in the wider sense, um, commercialization is important because, you know, one, it leads to more successful companies. Well, theoretically, if you have a product that is commercializable and you are selling a product, obviously your company is going to grow. You're going to be a successful company. You're going to hit the market. However, as we see, it doesn't mean that your company is, you know, untouchable. Um, even companies that have a successful commercial product can eventually fail if they're not continuing to develop and they're not continuing to innovate. Um, that is one thing that most companies always have to keep on top of. Uh, commercialization in, uh, leads to increased American prosperity because it helps businesses grow. It helps actually put more funds out there into the um, state through things like gross receipts taxes. It leads to more jobs because a company that is growing is going to need to hire more people. They're going to need to pay more. And it leads to you know, better placement of things like interns, students, leads to workforce development. Really, commercialization is kind of that backbone about how our global, our not a necessarily global, but it really how our American market operates. Um, we operate based on commercialization. We operate based on that potential to bring a product to market and to sell it. So where can you find commercialization assistance? Well, commercialization assistance is offered, again, through some federal programs. Um, many of the SBR, <clears throat> excuse me, many of the SBR and STTR agencies actually will offer some sort of commercialization accelerator or commercialization readiness program. Uh, for instance, NIH has a cohort-based uh, nine-month program for commercialization accelerators. Um, it's eligible to any of the phase two awardees, and they give about 80 awards per year. Um, and the entire purpose of that program is just to help you get a little bit further along. They'll actually match you with experts. They'll match you with you know, field capabilities. They'll match you with mentors who will help you develop your product and who will help you refine that model. Uh, DOD has a commercialization readiness program. The, one of the things with DOD is, so under the SBR and STTR programs, as mentioned, each agency, um, the 12 or the five, depending on the program, operate differently. Uh, with DOD, each of the service components that are under DOD actually operate differently as well. So the commercialization readiness program for the Army operates very, not very differently, but pretty differently than like the one offered under the Air Force or the one offered under the Navy. Generally, though, the commercialization readiness program is available to phase two awardees, and it just helps push the technology that one extra step. So like with NIH, where they try to match you with uh, capabilities out there already in the market, the commercialization readiness program is kind of doing that one-on-one -on -one guidance and trying to help you find who is going to be that uh, end customer. Also, there's state programs such as the SBR matching grant. Um, New Mexico has an SBR matching grant uh, and applications are actually open right now. Um, they close November 2nd. 
And the application is open to anybody that either is a current phase one or phase two awardee or has received a notice of award, but the matching grant can help you commercialize your product. It can help you pay for things that are beyond the scope of your award. It can help you pay for things that, such as commercial, assist, uh, commercial assistance, trying to find things like an IP lawyer, you know, technology lawyer. Um, that is actually open for however you want to use those funds to help you commercialize your product. And then again, you have incubators and entrepreneurial development centers, such as Arrowhead Center. We have tools and assistance that are available to you know, clients throughout the state, uh, throughout our region, that can help you bring that um, product that one step closer. Because really, that's what commercialization, that commercialization pipeline is all about. How do you use the tools and resources that are already there to help develop your product and to help it get that one step closer? Um, and Jason, there are actually uh, contacts um, for that. They don't really help you apply for the SBR program, but I can actually um, send you more information about that. And so the NMFAST program, um, the NMFAST program, FAST stands for Federal and State Technology Partnership Program. It's um, funded by the SBA, and the goal is to, the overall goal is to strengthen the technological competitiveness of small businesses. Really what that means is the FAST program is set up to help small businesses, you know, put together their proposal package to help match them with capabilities, to help them find certain topic areas, even to th do things like help them, uh, provide them with um, small amounts of funding to put together their proposal or to manage their award. Under the FAST program, um, all 50 states, uh, the District of Columbia and the U.S. territories may apply. It's a one-year award um, from SBA. Uh, right now there are, I think, actually, they just made the announcements for a year four. Uh, NMFAST um, got to receive their year four funding. And I think there's actually 22 winners now. But various states um, have a FAST program, and there can only be one per state because part of the application process requires a letter from the governor of that state signing off on that proposal. Uh, this needs to be updated. But in FY18, um, these were the FAST um, awardees in the states that were uh, had a um, FAST program and also the Small Business and Technology Development Centers who provide a little bit more focused guidance on getting the technology ready. So they'll do a little bit more into things like you know, commercialization and helping innovation move along. Whereas the FAST sites generally are about helping you try and get together that first application or subsequent applications. So the NM FAST program our director is uh, Zeddy Sloan. She's actually based in Las Cruces, and she's the director of the uh, Arrowhead Technology Incubator. And then Dana Catron is our program manager. Um, she's based in Santa Fe, and she has a wealth of experience in um, research and grant and technical writing. So we really rely on the capabilities that we have in-house to put together a team that can help you develop that package, that can do things like walk you through your technology readiness levels, see if you have innovation going on, to try and figure out based on the product you're developing, what aspects are innovative. Because one of the things that people kind of forget about is innovative can be really anything as long as it's a process improvement or a development improvement. Um, a lot of people will say that they have a very specific product that answers a very specific need and can be sold in a very specific way, but they don't realize that, you know, the way they're doing their data analytics on things like their commercial um, potential or their market might be innovative in and of itself if they're using things like, if they created their own novel algorithm to help them find that out. So that's one of the other key aspects that the NFS program does is we help develop that idea about what is innovative from my idea, what are my capabilities, who can I take this to? Because you'll hit a lot more with a shotgun than you will with a rifle. And a lot of people just zero in and hone in on that one very specific product 
and then they miss the forest for the trees. So under NM Fast, we offer a lot of different services. Um, one thing that we have is a monthly newsletter, which we send out. It'll highlight aspects of some of the agencies that have changed, um, if they've made any changes to their requirements, if they have any webinars. We also include some of our tools and resources because that's one of the things that we develop is things like compliance matrices, checklists, even some templates to help almost do that fill in for what goes in this section, why is it important, why are they asking for this information. And then we also do um, video podcasts. Generally, those are anywhere from two to three minutes in length. And we'll talk about a very specific aspect of an agency. Like, um, for instance, National Science Foundation, we have a video about how you move through the registrations, what is important to know about getting those registrations set, what do you need to know about going through the registrations for each of the agencies, items like that. We also offer free workshops throughout the state. So our workshops, um, the things that are actually workshops are free to um, clients and free to any business or to anyone that wants to sit in and learn more about the SBR and STTR programs or the FAST program. Uh, we do actually have, as I mentioned at the very top of the uh, webinar here, we have an innovation summit coming up on December 12th. That's pretty much the only thing we ever charge for, and it's a nominal fee. Um, and then under um, NFS services, we also offer free SBR and STTR proposal development assistance. So that's that kind of guidance where you can bounce ideas off of us. You can make sure that uh, the things that you're writing actually fit the package. And we do the things like um, review services where We'll actually review sections of your proposal or the entire proposal itself to make sure that you're hitting all the guidelines, you're hitting the marks, because every agency will have their review criteria out there. And essentially, it's like reading the rubric for if you were in college. And when you're writing that term paper, which is your proposal package, you want to make sure you're hitting all the marks in that grading rubric, because that's how you get your A. And in the SBR and STTR world, an A means that you get money for your idea. That's how you get funding is getting that A. One of the things that we also offer too are small micro grants to help with proposal development. So with the proposal development, we'll actually have, if you have a very specific need and you have a certain section that you need assistance with, we have an entire network of service providers that we've established uh, contracts with that can work with you on doing things like helping you find your indirect rate for your budget, um, technical editing and review, um, writing assistance for a very specific purpose or a very specific need. So that's just our impact across the state. Um, these are everywhere that we've held uh, workshops that we have partner organizations or that we have clients. Um, anybody that's in New Mexico knows that there's a reason there's a lot of uh, empty space there and that's because in a lot of those er areas of empty space, really not nothing there. And our uh, micro grants are really considered a phase zero. Um, you can get up to two micro grants awarded for the same SBR and STTR proposal. Um, again, it's for very specific services of development. Uh, we have established the rate with the contractor. So, and when you're working on your proposal, we're always actually going through and kind of evaluating where a company is, where a business is, where their need is for that proposal onto whether um, they're ready for a micro grant. So the big thing about the micro grant too is that the micro grant doesn't go to the business. The micro grant goes to the service provider to pay for service. So you don't have to worry about trying to work out a contract with someone. You don't have to worry about, you know, can I actually pay them? Am I going to have to wait on getting, you know, funding together to pay them? We actually work directly with that service provider. And we're continually develop that network. So if we have or we see a need that a lot of our clients have that is not currently represented in our service provider network, we'll actually go through and try and find somebody 
that has that ability, that has that capability and has that expertise and bring them in, negotiate that rate and make sure that they can actually provide service to the clients based on um, a 600, essentially $650 award. And again, the eligibility for the micro grants is actually determined after we do our intake interview. Um, and we constantly monitor. So just because you may not be ready for a micro grant at the moment, doesn't mean that you will never be available to have a micro grant. So really in summary, NMFAST assists in identifying appropriate agencies and topic areas, um, provides how-to information on things like your registrations, how to move through the proposal submission process, where the electronic forms are, and guide you on that proposal preparation. Um, again, we can actually work through uh, things like technical objectives, commercialization plan. Um, we'll actually provide some critique. Really the only thing that we don't do for clients is help actually write sections for them. One, because you're the person with the innovation, you know it best, and two, because you know that would be a huge conflict of interest. And Jason, for the micro grants, it's actually something that when we do the intake interview, you just um, show or there's a question on the intake interview, making sure that you're aware of what the micro grants are and that you're interested in it. And as we work with somebody, we'll actually continually to re uh, continue to review where they are, where they stand, how close they are to getting a proposal together and kind of make that determination. Um, the micro grants are a funding vehicle that we have that kind of almost renew on a quarterly basis. So we might be out of funding for micro grants in a quarter, but we might have more um, funding available in a next quarter. All right, so that pretty much wraps up the presentation today. Um, I hope it was informative and Otherwise, are there any questions?